Okay. So, uh, well, again, uh, thanks for, for having me here and, and uh, admitting uh, me to this meetup uh, without knowing what exactly I'm going to do and, uh, and how I do my talks, but, well, here I am. Um, I want to give a very, very short introduction about myself, uh, simply saying, uh, well, I am Niels. Um, I work at a company called Nine Elements. Uh, we are based in Bochum. And if you want to talk to me or contact uh, me, you find me on Twitter. Um, if you maybe want to talk to me but say, please, no more CSS stuff, you can also talk to me about paper folding. I love origami. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that I do when I'm not doing uh, front-end design stuff. So, but that's uh, everything for, for me. Um, I will go on with my talk now. So. When I started uh, doing web design, web development about like uh, 10 to 20 years ago, everything was uh, really easy. We had the design part, then we had the front end development and the back end development. And over the last years, uh, something new emerged here that is called uh, front end design. I think it was uh, Brett Frost who came up with the term. Sometimes it's referred to as uh, UX engineering or interface development, but it is all the same. Um, what it is, if you haven't heard this term before, it is uh, people that are interested in HTML, CSS, and uh, presentational JavaScript. And um, I will write down some things, uh, there are some tasks that you can, uh, can do during a web development process. And I think we could argue about every single word here for like hours. But uh, this is not the point here. What I want to say is that on the far left side, you have something that is clearly uh, belongs to the design part, say, doing some illustration, drawing stuff, doing photography. And then this starts with the user interface design, UX design, and you go over to the far right end where you have this API stuff, data storage, uh, business logic, and so on. And what is interesting for me is that when companies are try searching for a full stack developer, full stack development means something like this to them. So we have to do everything except for maybe drawing an illustration. So, but you have to have at least a basic knowledge about user interface design because this is what you're building in the end, a user interface. And uh, you have to do everything. This is a full stack developer. Um, but I was always asking myself, how do you do you learn this? And uh, when you start learning things, uh, I saw this little meme here that you you are a newbie and you just jump everything. You start with React and then you apply at Facebook. And for some time, this bothered me, and I got quite angry about this because I think I value CSS and HTML, and I think this is so important. But this changed a little bit for me because I think. It is OK to, to do this. If you're interested in JavaScript frameworks and all this stuff, then please do this and do this, because you cannot uh, learn everything at the same time. But we all have to acknowledge that if people are more, more and more interested in this, the full stack development becomes more something like this. And if we have, on the one hand, people that are doing just pure design stuff. And on the other hand, we have people starting with presentational JavaScript. It means there is no front-end design at all. And if you have no front-end design, you will end up with uh, something like this. You have your expectations on the one hand, but the reality is kind of not what you wanted to have. So this is why we need front-end design. And I'm kind of focusing on this part here. Um, because the problem we now had in our company, for example, is where do we find people that are excited about front-end design? And um, well, I can say about myself, I don't know if I'm any good, but I uh, at least can say that I love all this stuff that has to do with uh, UI design, UX design, HTML, also accessibility, speed. I just love this uh, these languages. And I looked and saw, well, what did I do before I did, uh, before I started, um, web design, web development. And I studied the uh, history of art. And I thought maybe I did learn something there that helps me nowadays uh, when I do my work as a front end designer. And I think I found some things there 
And um, I want to share this with you so that maybe there is something that can help you as well. So uh, I will show you a couple of paintings and we will start with a very easy one. This one here, I love this painting. It is uh, by Robert Rauschenberg and it's called White Painting. Uh, this is the seven panel version here. It's from 1951. And uh, just to be clear, this is not one painting with uh, small lines on it. It is uh, like, uh, it says seven panels, so seven canvases, very narrow, and they are put next to each other. And they are painted with white paint. Uh, there's also the four panel version and uh, three panel version. Then you have the two panel version and of course also the one panel version. Uh, but don't mistake this one with this painting here. This is by uh, also an artist called Robert, but this is by Robert Ryman. And I think it's from 1965, so 14 years later. So we see it's something completely different. So back to this one here, where we have the Robert Rauschenberg seven panel white painting. What I really like about this painting is uh, there was nine years after he painted it, there was an exhibition, I think, somewhere in Norway, I don't know, at least in Europe, and he was living in the United States. And uh, uh, they wanted to have uh, his paintings for this exhibition, and uh, Robert Rauschenberg said, well, um, transporting these and having them on the plane, they could be damaged, this is kind of expensive. Uh, I'll tell you what to do. See? Um, you know, you have uh, the size of the canvas at seven times 100 and roughly 80 centimeters by 45 centimeters. The paint is uses latex paint. And then he said, paint them so they look like they haven't been painted. No hand, just put a coat of paint on them. And then there was his assistant, Bryce Martin. He traveled to uh, the museum and he painted them, doing his best to uh, do uh, what uh, the artist told him and painting the pictures. And then we have them. Here uh, it is uh, the painting. And what's interesting now is what was printed beneath it. And it said Robert Rauschenberg, 1951. So um, what this process is, it reminds me kind of how a website is rendered. Because you could say that this is the HTML and CSS. This is the introduction of how the final painting should look like. Then we have the browser doing his best here, the assistant, to interpret the information and building the final painting. And we have the rendered website here. So this is kind of cool, I think, that you have this painting in a digital form where you, uh, you have like the digital information about the painting and then you have the analog uh, painting itself in the museum. And if you want to, you can paint it yourself and have an original Robert Rauschenberg uh, in your living room if you have enough space to put it there. So this is uh, the first painting that I like. And uh, the next one uh, is maybe a little more of you know this one. It's by uh, Marguerite. Uh, and I don't speak French, so don't make me uh, read uh, the title here. It's from 1929, so we're going a little bit uh, back in the uh, in time. And uh, yeah, what we're seeing here, at least we are seeing something here now, is a pipe, and underneath it, there's uh, this little sentence, ceci n'est pas un pipe, which translates to, this is not a pipe. And I always think about this painting here when I'm uh, looking at some, some layout done in, let's say, Sketch, Figma, whatever you like. Um, and I'm thinking, well, what we're seeing here is not a website. Um, you may have done this yourself, like saying, okay, this may look like a website, but it is not a website in the end. You can do a prototype, but still it is not a website. And the same uh, thinking is going on here. We are, we are seeing uh, there's this painted pipe, but it is not a pipe at all. And uh, funny thing here is even if you wanted to build a pipe, from this paint here, you have to know quite a lot about pipes to actually build it. You have to know that it's open at the far right end. You have to know its size, the material it is made of. So in the end, this is just a representation of a pipe and it is not a pipe, just as uh, a layout is and never will be uh, a real website. Okay, 
Now, you see these lessons are getting a little shorter here. Uh, we're going uh, even more, uh, traveling back in time a little more to this uh, beautiful painting here by uh, Georg Flegel. It is called uh, Stillleben mit Käse und Kirschen, uh, which translates to still life with cheese and cherries, and it's from 1635. I think it is the smallest of the paintings we're having here. It's uh, uh, like a regular paper or something, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And, uh, well, coming from the white painting to the pipe one, there is quite a lot of stuff going on here in this painting. You see there's the glass of wine on the left, and we have the silver plate uh, arranged on it is the cheese. Uh, I don't know if you see my cursor. Uh, this is the cheese, by the way. Uh, and the knife and the bread and a, a dragonfly on top of it. And uh, then we have some almonds uh, and some berries and some cherries scattered around all there. So this is what uh, what's uh, shown on this painting. Uh, for those of you who are uh, know the Christian religion, uh, you may already have seen that on this painting there is much more going on. We have everything from uh, original sin to Jesus, Jesus' crucifixion, uh, resurrection, and final salvation is on this. And uh, for those of you who did not see this at first glance, I will try to explain this. So... Uh, Everything started uh, with Adam and Eve in paradise, and then there was this original sin thing going on, Eve eating the apple. Uh, and this, he, she was seduced by the devil, and the devil in form of a snake. And you have the snake uh, in the glass uh, here on the bottom left corner. And uh, we don't have an apple here, but we do have cherries, and cherries are also symbols for... Um, fruits from paradise so they work as well we also have uh right where the original sin starts uh, we have to talk about a prophet the prophet if you are a christian and you believe this uh is jesus and uh these almonds here are a symbol for jesus um all nuts by the way are symbols for jesus because um his uh the the hard shell here is a symbol for his suffering and the soft fruit is a symbol for his kindness so this is uh, the talk of the prophet going on here. You also have these berries here. In uh, German, they are called Johannisbeeren. If you translate this word by word, it would mean John berries. And you have John the Baptist. So Jesus is baptized around here, and you have his life going on. And uh, if you know, Jesus' life did not end very well. He was crucified, and you have the cherries here, which are the evil fruit, you know, from the beginning, building a cross down here. So this cross is uh, the symbol for Jesus' crucifixion. But his life did not really end. He was resurrected and he died for our sins. And you have this holy communion thing uh, where in church now you eat bread in the symbol of uh, Jesus' uh, body. Um, and this is the bread is up here and it's alongside the knife and the knife is pointing up against the reading direction because uh, you're reading in Western languages from left to right. So this is the reading direction and the knife is pointing upwards against it. So very strong uh, up, upwards uh, drift here and it's pointing to the wine and the wine is a symbol for Jesus' blood and the bread and the blood is what finally crashes the snake down here and gives us, in the end, salvation. Bow. So this is what's all going on here in this painting. And I could now also start talking about alignment and golden ratio and all of this stuff, but I don't want to bore you too much with this. Um, you might already ask yourself, what has, does all of this have to do with uh, front-end design and how can this help me in my daily work? Well, I will tell you. Um, you hopefully have learned now that every element here has a distinct purpose that uh, uh, has a, uh, yeah, it, it, its own purpose. And also its place on the painting is very important. Like uh, this wine here, you could maybe change it to red wine. It would work as well. But you could not... Uh, switch it with milk because uh, milk does have uh, very other symbols here and also these cherries in the far right corner they have to form this cross it's really important to to know all this uh, Jesus stuff so 
you analyze this painting here and you ask yourself what's the purpose of every single element and what's its job and how can I preserve this when I need to do any modifications here. And this is what we are doing now when, when looking at a very simple layout and trying to, uh, to use what we have learned here. So uh, we have this layout given to you by your designer friend. And then you can use whatever tool you want. Let's say it's Envision or Sketch or uh, Figma, whatever, to, to know all the numbers here, to know um, all the margins and paddings. And there's something quite strange going on in this layout here. You see this uh, large headline is not centered. Um, it is uh, in here is kind of a, a container. And inside it, there's an additional margin going on here. And you could translate all of these pixel values to some CSS. And um, as this is a CSS uh, meetup, I think you are all familiar with CSS. So I named this whole thing fancy text. And then I mostly uh, took all the pixel values and put it here. So we have the font size, line height, margin, font weight, all of this. But you all know that as soon as I started to resize my browser and narrow the screen, this layout would break. Um, and I needed some media queries to, to fix this. And uh, well, this is maybe not the best approach. So I want to show you some something that is a little different here. So instead, I look at this thing here again and ask myself, what's the uh, artist's intention here? So the designer's intention. And there are three things that I think are kind of important for this layout here to work. First thing is this headline here. It is really huge. You see there, it is not about readability anymore. This is a headline that spans nearly the whole um, space that is available here. So um, this is kind of a substitute for an image that's not there. The, uh, designer wanted you to stare at the typography and, and acknowledge this beautiful letters here. So this is what's going on in the headline. Um, the paragraphs are a little different. Here it is really about readability. We have a nice uh, width of the paragraph. We have a nice uh, line height and so on. So this is mostly about, uh, this is the content, the real content that you have to read. And this is done about readability. And the last thing that is interesting is the layout itself. You see, you have some space up here. Then you have the text indented over here and a little bit less space on the right one. So this is the third thing that I kind of want to preserve. And how do I do this? I start with the headline. And uh, instead of looking at these 160 pixels, I kind of compare this uh, to uh, the whole viewport, which is 1,440 pixels in this case, because this seems to be the new normal when you're working on a design. Um, and instead of using pixels, I go for viewport units. And I always keep a little bit of M in here. Um, I'm told this is better for uh, accessibility. But the most, uh, the major part of it will be done by viewport units. You see that's 10 viewport units, uh, which makes the text size uh, change dramatically once you change uh, the browser width. So uh, this stays almost um, always as big as possible, uh, given the browser size. So this is for the headline. Um, now looking at the paragraph here, the width of the paragraph is 720 pixels. And I could go now for a max width of 720 pixels. But again, here, I want to see, OK, what is 720 pixels? And in this case, it's the width of uh, 50 times the character zero. And this, uh, knowing this, I can use this in uh, CSS and setting a max width of 50 characters. And the CH unit is the width of the letter zero. So uh, it's even better than using M because if for some reason there was uh, another font loaded here that is much more narrow or wide, um, I'd still have the same number of uh, characters in this paragraph. And this is what you're aiming when you're doing setting a max width for a good line length. So uh, this is the character unit that I'm using here. And that's the second part. And the third one and final one is this uh, distribution here that we have. Um, and 
Again, we're having the pixel values 230, 344, and 114. They look really random. But if I compare them a little, we could say roughly uh, the far right corner uh, column here is one third. This is uh, two times this um, column here. And 344 is roughly three times uh, the third column. And they are mostly empty. So it, it is kind of white space. And distributing white space is something that you could not do in CSS for a long time. But finally, with the grid, you can do it. And this is, I think this is really awesome that you can do this. So uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm using grid for laying out this uh, little layout here. And it's not too complex. Uh, mainly, what I'm saying here is I use the fraction unit. And the fraction unit uh, works in a way that uh, the browser asks, hey, is there after I put in all the content that I have, is there some space left? And if yes, then it gets, gets distributed like two times here, three times here, and one time over here. And then I only have to place uh, my headline here uh, starting at the second line. This would be here. First one would be here on the far left and ending at the fourth line and the paragraphs starting at the third line and ending here as well. OK. Combining all of this together, um, the CSS looks like this. You see, we have the fancy text. This is the uh, outer diff or whatever you're having here. There's a grid thing uh, I talked about just yet. Then you have the headline with the calculated font size and placed to the grid column. The rest is just line height, font weight, and so on. And you have the paragraph. I put in a tiny bit of viewport width here as well. but or not as much as I did here, just a tiny bit, so that it gets a little larger when I'm uh, on a big screen, and the max width here to 50 characters. So when I compare this one to the initial CSS that I showed you, then, well, yeah, it did get a little bit more complex. You see we had 19 lines here, and we have 21 lines here. But it is not too complicated, I think. And instead of having a layout that breaks whenever uh, you start resizing your browser, we now have a perfectly responsive layout that um, doesn't need any media query and preserves the designer's intention. And I will show you how it looks. You see here how the indention is, is changing. And you always have this nice readable paragraph here. And you have this one third over here, three times the width down here. And you see, if as long as it's uh, very narrow, we only have one column because, uh, yeah, there's no space left. And I can show you again how this looks. Here you can see how the white space is distributed here. Uh, with the pink uh, columns. So, and uh, you see, what I think is really important here that we have the designer's intention, the indented uh, text in, in the bottom, the really large headline that is uh, always quite large, and the good readable paragraphs uh, underneath it. So, the next time when you get a layout and you see a layout, which is not a website, and I hope uh, you do understand this all the time, please try to analyze where the things are, what the element's purpose is, and try to preserve it. And this is, um, for me, what uh, front-end design is really about. And I hope that in the future, front-end design will get the love uh, that it deserves. And uh, well, with that, I say, uh, Thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, I think if you do have any questions uh, whatsoever, I'm, I'm happy to answer them.